Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, the birthplace of the International Monetary Fund. At the INET conference, hundreds of economists brought together by George Soros' organization to find a solution or debate solutions to the economic crisis. There's barely a panel or a sentence in this conference that doesn't mention the word China. Now joining us is one of America's foremost China experts, Orville Schell. Orville's the Arthur, Arthur Ross Director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society of New York. He's a former professor and dean at the University of California, Berkeley School, Graduate School of Journalism. Thanks for joining us. So at the opening panel, George Soros starts by saying, I'm baffled. And he specifically says he's baffled that more corrective action hasn't been taken to dealing with the, uh, pro the causes of the financial meltdown, more, more or less the regulation of Wall Street. He says that he, his framework of looking at the world would have suggested after such a meltdown, there would have been a push to take real action. So when China looks at the United States and sees it seems so little has been done to deal with some of the underlying issues, and given how many American T-bills China owns, how do, they, how do they look at all this? Well, you know, China has traditionally, I think, looked up to the United States, particularly as it's begun to marketize and to uh, uh, allow its economy to open up. Um, and they've viewed America as sort of the titan of the world, as most countries have also done. Uh, so I think it's with some surprise that they saw this titanic country and the world's largest economy uh, just uh, kind of go into implosion. And it's taken a lot of adjustment for them, as it has for us, to kind of adjust to the fact that this country, which for so many years they were against, that they admired, that they loved, that they hated, but that was always hugely important and seemingly implacable to them, that it could have been so fallible. Now, China kept its cool, uh, and in fact kept buying T-bills, uh, and kept sending signals that, well, we have faith in the U.S. economy and it, it will all work out. Uh, I, they really had no choice but to say those things. But do you get a sense, what do they really think about it? They, uh, th there must have been some shaking of their confidence in, in where all this is leading. Well, I think uh, the Chinese leadership uh, was very rattled to find this sort of pillar of the whole financial architecture of the global economic system so uh, unstable. Uh, and it's true they've invested many hundreds of billions of dollars in, in, in treasury bills and other forms of American securities. And they will continue to do so, not because they aren't uh, uh, bothered by what they see, by the fragility of our own system, but because there's no other place for them to put it. Where else did they put all the capital? And they're collecting huge amounts of foreign exchange, and they've got to park it someplace. And uh, in a certain sense, there is a kind of a, 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 a symbiotic relationship that's almost like some drunk and their spouse, which is they lend to us, we borrow, we spend in a profligate manner, but we buy their stuff. They make the money, get the foreign currency, and give it back to us so that we can go deeper in debt to buy from them. That's what's been going on until the financial crisis. Now, that's got to change. China recognizes, and I think we do too, they can't just be an export economy. They have to start generating a greater level of consumption within China. But there, the Chinese run into a structural problem of their own that they have a very high savings rate, which means people don't consume as much as they could. Why? Because they don't have a welfare system and a health care system that provides for people in their own age, old age. So people lock up their money. So, it's only to say, and one of the reasons why China comes up every other sentence here in Bretton Woods and every place else, is because the U.S. and China are insolubly locked together now with one set of sort of or economic internal organs. Now, Soros's point about being baffled was that he was baffled that there wasn't more serious regulatory action taken to control Wall Street. Given how much at stake China has in all this, they must be more than baffled. Are they not concerned that the underlying reasons have not been addressed? This could all happen again, and they own so many American, so much American debt 
that, that, or do they just think this economy is just too big, that this is a, an American economy too big to fail? Well, here I think the Chinese leadership and George Soros are in accord, strangely. They both believe the, the United States has been very reckless in escaping and refusing to uh, 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 sort of regulate itself in a way that would make the system safer for everybody. And it, after all, it isn't just the Americans that suffer when the American financial system is shaken. It's the whole world, China included. So China looks at the United States with a good deal of trepidation. But it isn't like there are an awful lot of alternatives for them to go to. First of all, to buy T-bills, which are safe. I mean, unless the US defaults, which I think it very small likelihood of that. Second of all, we're in this whole new world now where China is piling up capital that wants to go someplace, and it doesn't want just these low-yield treasury bills or other kinds of securities. It wants mergers and acquisitions. It wants high-yield investments. And what better place to invest than in the US? But of course, here we run into a certain ambivalence because what you're talking about is starting to buy stuff rather than to buy T-bills. In other words, you buy mines and you buy factories and perhaps you buy banks. They want brand name, big league companies. They want to run with the big guys. And China's had a very difficult time getting any company to be sort of brand known on a global scale. I mean, if I ask you how many Chinese companies do you know the names of, you might think of Lenovo, bought IBM, or you might think of parts of IBM, or higher, the, 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 the uh, you know, white, wear, white goods uh, company. Well, why, but, why, don't they, why don't they buy Walmart, given that Walmart is essentially I don't think Walmart is, <laughs> is for, for sale, sale. <laughs> but I, they might like to. But can you imagine the reaction in America? That would be like, uh, you know, buying the Queen of England. Uh, these are very symbolic things that, uh, and America is not, in, in not adjusted well at all at this point to the idea that someone else might start owning us just the way But there's no, there's no legal way to stop it, uh, really, is there? No. Uh, legally, uh, one would have to say America is an open market. We believe in allowing foreign direct investment from around the world. It's a great virtue of this country and also a great strength. However, we have certain neuralgia against certain kinds of countries, like sometimes Arabs and China, because it's uh, run by the Chinese Communist Party. So what happens is they'll want to buy a company. And there is a review process, but just for national security purposes. It's seldom used, but people just start talking. Congressmen start writing letters. Investment bank gets scared. The Chinese investments don't want to have their name dragged through the mud and poof, the deal evaporates. That's been the pattern. Not a healthy one, I should say, for the United States or for China. We, we go back to this issue we were talking about previously, which is when China looks at the debate in the American politics right now, the stimulus versus austerity, all the austerity hawks seem to be winning this debate. The Obama administration seems to have bought into this idea that the idea is pay down the debt. They're debating how much. In China, the issue, they, they understood there should be stimulus, they, and they, they, the austerity regime there was never their, their way out of the crisis. So if they look at this American debate, and one, one would think if there's austerity and with the layoffs coming at the state municipal levels and the, and the likelihood of unemployment not going down further, many people are saying it's going to go back up again once the real uh, hit hits the st at the state level. Do, what do they make of this? They didn't follow these policies in China, and they have so much American debt at stake. I think the Chinese, like many other uh, countries, have a lot of catching up to do to figure out what's going on in America with these Tea Party people. Where did they come from? You know, what's this all about? How, in the name, in their view, uh, of heaven, has the United States of America, land of reason, freedom, scientific thinking, rationality. How has it been seized by people who believe in none of these things? And the Chinese really don't understand this well. They scratch their heads and they look at us and they need a lot of help 
as many Americans do, to understand what is happening to this great country. But, but clearly it's, it's, a, it's a section of the American elite that's behind, and the, the famous the ones out front are the Koch brothers, but they can't be doing this all on their own. And, and there's this, you know, Karl Roves and others were all involved in the uh, last November election mm -hmm. campaign. This, there's a whole section of the American elite that's, that sees the, the necessity, they think, of austerity. Mm -hmm. They make paying down the debt the big issue, and they're absolutely against paying any kind of taxes. Mm -hmm. So the, the Chinese, are they going to weigh in on this in any way, or is it just too difficult well, for them to say anything? They don't believe in interfering in the internal affairs of other countries because they don't want anyone to interfere in their internal affairs. So they're not, not likely to give us you know, a lot of gratuitous advice about how to run our affairs. However, they are worried, as everybody must be worried about America, because Mer America sits at the center of everything. So as we go, uh, in certain respects, so goes the world. So it's, it's very important, I think, that, that America figure itself out better. In the meanwhile, it leaves a lot of other people around the world scratching their head. And that's why it's so important that our financial system remain open, as we always have been, that's been our great strength, and receptive to other countries investing in it. Because if we begin to get into trade wars, you know, protectionism, tit for tat kind of uh, deals, and we're particularly inclined to do that with China, it could be very deleterious, does, not only to our health, but the health of the global financial system. Does China have a plan <clears throat> B? If, if, the, if they think the American Politic politics is going to push American economics really into some downward spiral. Have they got a plan B not to be drawn into it? Well, you know, there really is no plan B for anybody. America is too large on the sort of economic, uh, international economic scene. Uh, China is, of course, investing very vigorously in Latin America, Africa, Middle East, around the world, particularly in natural resources. But that still doesn't sort of take up the slack. They're doing that for uh, energy security and resource security. But they've piled up, you know, an awful lot of foreign exchange reserves, and they've got to do something with it. So the question is what? The euro is a bit wobbly, and all these crazy countries in Athens and, you know, Greece and Portugal on the abyss, and Japan's no great shakes, the yen. Where else do you put your money? They're a very limited set of options. So the U.S. is still a good option. So one hopes that that partnership between the U.S. and China can work its way out in a constructive manner because in actuality, the U.S. now could use Chinese investment for job creation and infrastructure building. That's why it's so important. And that's why the U.S.-China relationship simply cannot be ignored because without it, uh, well, there is no without it. Is only with it. So you've got to get it right. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. <clears throat>